Today, we are on week two of our series, our brand new series, titled Conflict. And the vision behind this series is to show you how to deal with difficult people. Not only that, but how to deal with difficult situations, because it can be very hard not to get in your flesh, right? Somebody says something about you, you want to say something back. Like, I can't believe what they just said. Can you believe they said this about me or about my family? Oh, I have some choice words to say back at them. Or somebody hurts your family. We'll talk about that. Somebody says something about your kids. Something, somebody says something about your future, telling you you're going nowhere, even though you already know what God has spoken over you. But it can be very easy to be in our flesh, right? And try to handle things the way we want to handle it and not from a biblical perspective. So that is the reason and the vision behind this series is to show you how, according to the word of God, to handle conflict and, and see a solution brought to the problems you may be dealing with today. And the first solution that I want to share with you today is this. You have been called not to disrupt the peace, but actually bring peace into any situation. Any situation, even the difficult ones, the ones that you don't want to be around, God has called you as believers in Christ to bring peace into any situation. Let me show you three reasons why, according to the Bible. The first reason is this. To be a peacemaker actually means you are a child of God. The world will know that you are a child of God because you don't act like them. You get that? You don't say the same things that they say. You don't bring this darkness and this heaviness into the room, even though things may be chaotic and nobody has a solution or an answer. When you walk into the room as a believer in Christ, you are called to be a peacemaker. And because of that, they will know that you're different, that God is living and working through you. Matthew chapter five, verse nine states it like this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. People will know that you are a child of God because you bring peace into any situation. That also means they're going to call you. They're going to look towards you for help and guidance and leadership. So this means something else that's very important. The second point is this. Without showing the world the peace of God, the world will not know God. Without showing that peace, that difference, that love of God through any situation, listen, it's because of you and Christ living inside of you that people know that God is good. Hallelujah. I didn't know God could work through me like that, right? Because the old me didn't act like that. But the new you can walk into any situation and say, you know what? God still loves you and he can change the situation around. And those few words of hope, you know what it does to somebody? It changes their life. You understand that? Just a few words of hope, that foundation, that faith in Jesus Christ can change your life forever. The second point was this, without showing the world the peace of God, the world will not be able to know the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15 stated like this, make every effort, I love this, to live in peace with the people you love, with the people that like you, the people that comment on your pictures and like your stuff, no to live at peace with everyone, even the people that get on your nerves and say things about you, and to be holy. Why? Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So listen to this. So make sure no one falls short of the grace of God because there may be a bitter root that grows up, and if it grows up inside of you, it will cause trouble and defile many. Jesus is teaching us how to overcome the enemy. And he's saying, by you being a peacemaker, walking into any situation, you attack the bitterness that wants to consume your heart. Because when you have conflict, there's frustration, right? Somebody has made you angry. Somebody has said something about you. That's the reason you need to discuss it so that it can be settled. And if you're not careful and you open a door to the enemy, what happens? That root of bitterness takes up. And you start to look at people in a different way. You no longer see people as God sees them. You see them as an enemy, as an opponent that you want to knock out. So Jesus said, no, no, overcome that. You're not a slave to that. Because you can bring peace into any situation. And I'm with you. You are not alone. Don't you worry. I am here. We can rest on the goodness of God. And we show the world the love of God because we don't act like the world. And that good stuff. But the last point is this. Now, this may be heavy, but I believe it's an eye-opener for some of us today. 
Here it is. What you sow is what you reap. What you sow is what you reap. Guess what? If you're in a relationship and you're constantly sowing peace, guess what you'll get in return? Eventually. You may not see it right away, but eventually you're going to get peace back. If you sow happiness into a relationship or a situation or any conflict, guess what will happen and come back at you? Happiness. If you put in joy, right, and people know that you're a good person to be around because they love, they hear the word of God from you, guess what? They will bring joy back into your life. I just want to say thank you so much for your words and your encouragement. You changed me, right? But what happens if you go into a situation the other way around and you sow more conflict, right? You sow more anger, right? People, you walk into the room and everybody knows, oh, you're in a bad mood. Everybody knows because you want them to know, right? I'm angry. It's somebody. Somebody did something and I'm going to blame you today. And everybody feels your wrath. Guess what you'll get in return? Their wrath, the rebellion. If you sow revenge, you will get revenge in return. It's just like the saying, what goes around comes around, okay? The Bible says it like this, what you sow, you will reap. Let me read this. James chapter 3. Verse 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is, first of all, it's pure. It's also peace. It's loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism, okay? And it's always sincere. And those who are, listen to this, who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace. What would they reap? A harvest of righteousness, what you sow into a relationship, into a situation in your life, you will reap, okay? You have been called to be a peacemaker. And we may be joyful in that, but do we really understand what it means? Because I see a lot of people confused, okay? If I'm meant to be a peacemaker, does that mean that I become a pushover? Does that mean that I go into any situation and just say, yes, yes, I don't want to offend you. I don't want to ruffle your feathers. I don't want to say anything you may not like. I just want to bring peace. Peace. Is that peace? Or is that killing you on the inside? Okay. So let me make it very clear. According to the word of God, as a peacemaker, you're not called to let people push you over to hurt you or hurt other people. You actually can stand up against that. And the reason why I know that's true is because Jesus did it. If you were here last week, I told you many examples of Jesus standing up to the Pharisees. Why? Because they were condemning and judging people to hell. Every time they walk into a room, we talk about the narcissistic behavior, that attitude that I'm better than you. Okay? They would walk into a room and say, I'm better than you. You can never be like me. You can't be perfect like this. So Jesus put them in their place in a loving way. Let me share this with you. And I love this because Jesus said this, not only in front of the disciples or the Pharisees, but in front of a crowd. So listen to his words. Matthew chapter 23, verses one through five. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, well, they are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So he said, so practice what they tell you to do. <laughs> but then he says, but do not follow their example, for they do not practice what they teach. Now imagine the Pharisees in that moment. Like, what, what did you say? What did, what did, you, did you just say we don't live out what we're teaching? Jesus is like, yeah, let me continue, okay? All right, just listen up. He said, they crush people with unbearable religious demands. They never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for a show. This is selfish ambition. And if you know somebody that's truly selfish, it's all about them. When they walk into a room, they want you to know that. They want you to see that they are important. So Jesus is saying, everything you're doing is for a show. And God knows your heart. God knows what's on the inside. So he said, listen to their teachings, but do not do as they do. And in verse 13, he says this. Jesus said, what sorrow awaits you, you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Because you're hypocrites. That's what Jesus said. He said, you're hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. And you won't go in yourselves, and you don't let others enter either. Now, Jesus, I need you to understand, according to the book of Isaiah, he is called the Prince of Peace. 
Jesus himself is the king of all kings, Lord of all lords. He is the prince of peace. Yet we see this prince of peace standing up to the Pharisees, telling them how it is. Why? Because he's protecting those from being condemned to save the lost. This is righteous anger. Okay, this is a a righteous judgment. This is why God is a good judge, because he's a righteous judge. He sees those who are helpless and hurt, and he takes them, and he prepares punishments for our enemies so that we don't have to. He takes care of them for us. We just follow his will and his obedience. But I believe Jesus made a very powerful point, and here it is. Don't miss this. Being a peacemaker also means standing up against sin to protect the peace of others. Being a peacemaker means standing up against sin to protect the peace of others. Because what is peace according to the Bible? What is our hope? What is our foundation? Perfect peace is trusting the Lord, but it's also knowing our salvation comes through Christ. You realize that? Perfect peace is knowing that my salvation, my forgiveness all comes from Jesus Christ, and the devil can't take that away. I'm going to continue to follow the Lord. That's why Jesus stood up to the Pharisees, because they were bringing people the other way. into legalism and all these things that didn't matter. Listen to me. There is no true peace when you live in sin. There is no true peace in your life when you live in sin, and I get it. I hear some horrible stories. I cannot put myself in your shoes. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what people call you. I don't know what they have called you. I don't know your relationships. I don't know how hard it has been for you. And maybe it's difficult to the point where you come in here and you say, Pastor, I'm done. Let's be honest. I'm done. I keep trying to do the right thing. Where's it getting me? It just seems like the evil and the wicked people, they just keep getting ahead of me. They keep getting everything that I want. Nobody's putting them in their place. And I'm trying to do the right thing, and nobody sees me. And I'm alone. It could be very difficult. It could be very tempting to do so, right? But listen to me. Let me make it very clear. When you decide to ignore the Bible, or the advice that I'm giving you today from the Bible, from the Word of God, there will never, ever be peace in your life. I may make that very clear. You have the right to choose what you want to do. You can choose not to follow the Lord's way. You can do your own way, but I'm going to tell you now, you won't have peace. There'll be chaos, there'll be hurt, there'll be pain. And many of you who have been through it before, you know what it's like to try to control a situation and it explodes. And now everybody's hurt and you've done these things that are just wrong and how God can I get out of this? Listen, perfect peace is walking with Jesus Christ, walking in the Lord. God, I don't have it today. Let me be in your word though. God, I don't feel like it today, but let me be in your word. God, I don't know how to love people today, but I'm gonna be in your word. Because your word keeps telling me what I need to do, and it gives me strength. Perfect peace is found by walking with God, not away from him. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 states it like this. And let the peace, I love this, that comes from Christ, rule in your hearts. Where does peace come from? It doesn't come from this world, and it doesn't come from you trying to control people or control the situation. Peace only comes from Christ ruling over your heart. Let's continue the verse. For as members of one body, guess what? As believers, you're called to live in peace. To be different. To be a light in the darkness and always be thankful. And here's what I love about this passage of Scripture because it's saying this. When Jesus is ruling over your heart, you're always thankful. Through every circumstance. Why? Because, first of all, you know you're not alone God will never abandon you, and he can still do miracles today. What he has for you is good, even though you may not see it right now. But do you believe that for your own life? Keep walking with God even when it's difficult to do. But now let me ask another question. What does it matter? Right? Maybe you're saying, but pastor, I'm not a, I'm not a confrontational person. Right? I don't like confrontation. I don't like conflict. I avoid it like a plague. I just walk away from it. And so far, so good. So why does it matter for my life to be able to handle conflict from a biblical perspective? Let me state it like this. You may not have a serious conflict today, but one day you will. And if you do not handle it correctly, according to the ways of God, that one conflict can hover over your head your entire life. You understand? 
that one conflict that you, done, that you did not handle in the right way, in a God-fearing way, but only in your flesh, that could hang over your head all the way to your deathbed and disrupt the peace that God wants to work through you. So this is serious. So the title of today's message is this, Conflict to Keep Peace. We have to fight every day to keep our peace. Mental peace, our heart right with God, right? Because we deal with spiritual warfare around us, right? And here's the hard thing. Last week, I talked about dealing with conflict with non-believers or narcissistic people, people that are very selfish. Today, I'm going to talk about dealing with conflict with other believers. How do you handle that? How do you handle conflict with somebody that's supposed to believe and act the same way you do, yet you're not seeing those actions and things just get out of hand? How do you trust the Lord? Because let me say it like this. Again, conflict can hang over your head. What does that mean? Okay, conflict mishandled in the wrong way with your career, guess what, can have you blacklisted forever for that position. And a lot of us, we see our importance due to our title. What if that title was taken away from you? What if you don't have that position anymore because you handled conflict, you said the wrong thing, or you got physical in some, in some type of way, and all of a sudden now you know you can never have that job again, right? Or maybe a conflict, maybe you've had issues with your kids. Maybe you're a parent in the room, and you haven't handled it correctly, and so now your kids don't go to you anymore. They don't talk to you anymore. They don't trust you because maybe you said something that they came to you in confidence, hoping that you wouldn't tell anybody else, but it, you shared it, and you made a mistake, right? Right? Or maybe conflict in your marriage. Man, people love to avoid that. We just pretend that it's not there. And I'm telling you, it is a ticking time bomb that will eventually go off and you will have to address it. But guess what? When it goes off like that, everybody's angry and furious. And usually you're going to say something you're going to regret. God does not want that for you. You understand he wants to bring healing into your relationships, but I'm telling you today, avoiding conflict will also kill you on the inside. And it hurts your relationship with God, most importantly. Let me show you three reasons why, according to the Bible, avoiding conflict can hurt your relationship with God. The first point is this. Avoiding conflict can disrupt your intimacy with God. Avoiding conflict can disrupt your intimacy with God. Well, how, how is that possible? Okay, if there's something on your heart right now, and it's heavy, and it's a burden, or you have hate for somebody, or you're angry at somebody, or you have this bitterness inside of your heart, the word of God says, bring it to the Lord, okay? Bring it to the Lord so that there may be healing and deal with that person, okay? Get your heart right before you come into the presence of God. Why? Let me show you why. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, listen, listen to the words, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And I realize that when we read this, we're like, well, that sounds kind of harsh. I love God, but some people are just hard. How do we deal with that? I want you to see it the way God sees it. We come in here. Every Sunday, we shout hallelujah. Thank you, God, I love you so much. Oh, thank you, Jesus, you changed who I am and who I used to be, and you freed me, Father, from the, from the worst of my life. And thank you, God, that you rescued me. I love you. God is so good. We walk outside. Oh, I can't stand that person. Oh, do you see how they dressed today? Like, what's, what's, did they see a mirror this morning? Like, can you, can you believe it? And we start talking bad about people. But just a few minutes ago, your mouth was praising the Lord. And don't you see, don't you know that God sees right through that? He sees your heart, right? Even those people that bring conflict into your life, they're still created in the image of God. And we addressed that last week. Listen to Jer James chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, talking about our tongue and the words that we choose to use. Sometimes it praises our Lord the Father. But sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. Why? Because they're still created in the image of God. So blessings and cursings come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and my sisters, this is not right. But what do you do if you're around a, a person that says they're a believer? It says they know Christ but they constantly bring you down and degrade you 
and they call you names and they curse at you and they say all these things that doesn't glorify the word of God, it just shows you the world. And it brings you this pain. And can't you just say one thing back? Right, because it's, it's so tempting. Uh, can I just say one word that they chose to say against me? Can I just say it because they really hurt me with that one? And I just want to get them back just, just one time. Just put them in their place, Lord. Can I, can I do that? Can I condemn them? Again, there's a difference between righteous anger, okay, and, and, and standing up against somebody that's condemning somebody to hell, right? Because a lot of times we just get angry and we want to defend ourselves, And make ourselves look better than them. And if you're not careful, your flesh will get a hold of you. Guess what? You'll become just like them. And you'll sound just like them. And God doesn't want that for you, but it's so hard. So let me open your eyes to this today, because it's the way the Bible talks about it. I'm about to show you the scripture, but I want you to look at it like this, okay? When somebody speaks hateful words towards you, and you feel that hate, listen, that is the same hate that torments their heart on the inside. That's why it's so extreme, okay? That's why it's so heavy. That's why when you feel it, you're like, oh man, this hurts. Why? Because it's the same hate on the inside destroying their heart. When somebody comes at you and they lash out at you and they're angry all the time, you can see it in their eyes and their, 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 the way they move their body and everything, you feel this, right? It's the same anger that controls their life. For the Bible words it like this, listen, this is an open door for you to see what people have allowed inside their heart. It is an open door for you to see what people are tormented by and even see the demons that are in their life that they allow over and over again. For Luke chapter 6 verse 45 states it like this, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. But an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. The words you choose. So when you say, God, I just want to cut them down. Let me just say one thing. You will open up a door for the enemy to attack you the same way it's attacking them. But you want to know the good news? You're not a slave to hate. You're not a slave to the world. You know what that means? You don't have to act like them. And that's freeing. That's the grace of God. That is the goodness of God. Why? Because you're not a slave to hate. You don't have to do what it's telling you to do. You can love people and show them the glory of God. Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. Don't you know the father protects his child? Don't you know the father will grab the hand of a child and lead him across the street, lead him into a direction, give him clarity, and protect him from the things that are around him? Don't you know the good father will protect you? And he knows exactly how hurtful it can be because he's heard it. And he hears it till this day, every day. People curse the name of God. He knows what it feels like. But because he's a good father, he knows the love that he has for us, that he will never give up on us. Because even tomorrow, repentance can happen. Change can happen. But God wants to protect you from that. Christ should rule your heart, not hate. All right? So avoiding conflict and allowing these things in your life can disrupt your intimacy with God. The second point is this. Avoiding conflict can also disrupt your prayer life. Now, this is an interesting passage of Scripture. It's actually about marriage, and it's directed towards the husband. But I believe it's also a a great revelation to get your heart right and how to treat other people in order to hear from God clearly. Okay? 1 Peter 3, verse 7 states it like this. In the same way... You married men should live considerately with your wives, with an intelligent recognition of the marriage relation, honoring the woman as physically the weaker, but realizing that you are joint heirs of the grace, God's unmerited favor of life, in order that your prayers, listen to this, may not be hindered or cut off. Listen to those words. So that your prayer life shall not be hindered or cut off, otherwise you cannot pray effectively. And this passage of scripture is talking to husbands that are constantly negative or bringing their wives down. 
Okay, never humbling yourself, just creating conflict and always allowing your pride to get the best of you in any situation. You're always going to be dominant no matter what, even when you know you're wrong, because that's the pride inside of your heart. And I get it. Sometimes it could be the other way around, right? Even the wife can have pride in her heart and sometimes she always has to be right. But let me share this with you, okay? Or let me ask you this question first. In conflict, in marriage, in relationships, when is the last time you said, I'm sorry? Some of us are like, ooh, been a while. When is the last time you said, I'm sorry? Because we all fall short. Are we constantly pointing the blame to somebody else? It's their fault, it's their fault, it's your fault that this happened in my life. And the reason I'm not happy today, it's so easy to point the finger. And I'm telling you this, I'm sharing this with you because pride will always cause a fall. It will cause a fall of your family. And listen to me, according to the word of God, God bless you. It also will cause a fall to your prayer life. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, pride leads to conflict. I'm done. I'm not really done, but I could be done right there. Pride leads to conflict. Does it lead to conflict resolution? No. Pride will always lead you into conflict. Why? Because you're never going to be repentant in the presence of the Lord. So how can you hear from the Lord if you've never gone into the presence of God and said, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry as a friend, as a child, as a parent, as a spouse, or how I handled that situation. God, make me better and help me to handle things in a different way from how I usually handle it. It's at that moment you say those things, you see change in your life. You understand? And the last point of that is, is this. Avoiding conflict will disrupt your happiness. Avoiding conflict will always disrupt your happiness. Let me share it like this. You go on a honeymoon. Yay. But all you do is fight and argue. Is it fun? No. All right? You go on family vacation. You bring your family and you got your kids together, but there's conflict issues that just rise up and things are being brought up from the surface that you haven't talked about in a long time and everybody's screaming at each other, I just want to go home. You going to take a picture? Share it on Facebook, Instagram. Look at us. We're so happy. You know? What's it do? What about buying a house? That could be exciting. But what if it's a product due to divorce? Because there was no conflict resolution. And it changes everything. And it's, it, the reason why I'm saying this is because the world will tell you all these things make you happy. But if you don't know how to handle conflict from a biblical perspective, there's still a gaping hole inside of you. And that peace is not there. And I believe God can give you that peace today. But from a biblical perspective, just why Seriously, why, why do I have conflict with the people I love? Why do I have conflict with the people that I'm friends with? Why do I have conflict even in the church at times? Why do I have conflict? The reason why, the answer, is because we live in a fallen world. And the moment that sin entered into the world, what did Adam and Eve do? They blamed each other. It's her fault. Look what she did. She gave me fruit. I had to eat it. She gave it to me. I thought I could eat it, right? Right? Genesis chapter three, verse 12. The man said, the woman you put me here, or put here with me, she gave me some fruit. So I ate it. And then what did Eve do? Well, she blamed the devil, okay? The devil made me do it. Genesis chapter three, verse 12. Or I'm sorry, uh, verse 13. The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So since the very beginning, because of the fall, And the sin in this world, listen, our bodies, our flesh crave everything that will bring conflict into our life. Yeah, that's hard. It's a hard truth. Meaning everything our bodies want, everything our flesh craves will bring disruption into your life. Let me prove it to you. Galatians chapter five, verse 19 and 20. This is just part of it. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, listen to this, hatred, discord, jealousy, 
fits of rage, selfish ambition, and so on. All of the things your flesh craves will disrupt your peace. Are you giving into it? Let me make an example like this. Big Ryan, come out of here, brother. Brian, or Ryan wants to uh, work out a little bit, so I'm going to have him come over here. Because we've been talking about a gym, we've been talking about a ring, getting ready for an opponent, getting ready for conflict, right? So that means you've got to train. You've got to train for a match, you've got to train for this. And so I started to think, a lot of us come here on Sunday morning. See, he's already lifting this time. <laughs> Second service, he knows what's going on, right? I told him he could unbutton that too a little bit. Are you, are you single? All right, I'm just, uh, he's single. Oh, he's not single. Oh, never mind. He's off limits. Leave him alone. <laughs> that went south. Okay. <laughs> Let me get back. All right. So a lot of us come here on Sunday mornings and we're training, right? We're training. Okay, God, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be a better Christian. That's right. I'm going to love people. That's right. I'm going to be a peacemaker. No matter where I go, I'm ready, devil. Come on. And then the life happens. You just keep working out, brother. You know what's coming, don't you? All right. You just keep working out. I know you still have not eaten all morning. I know that. For, oh, well, I'm throwing hamburgers on the floor. That's okay. We'll get them later. All right. <laughs> oh, the second service is fun. Let me tell you. All right. Or if that's not good enough for you, let me bring some Twinkies. Who loves Twinkies in the room? Come on. Come on. Who loves Twinkies? You love, here you go. Here you go. Twinkie. Come to Authentic Church. Free Twinkies every Sunday. All right, and then if you really want to wash it down, come on. All right, you just keep working out, though. It's cool. We'll just see what happens. Isn't that ridiculous? How are you going to train right and keep your focus right when there's so many disruptions right next to you? Because guess what? His flesh, you don't have to keep doing that. His flesh, his flesh craves this. We crave this. Because in the moment, it feels good. But then over time, it's not healthy for our body. But I want you to understand, a lot of us do this with conflict, okay? We're trying to train to be peacemakers, yet we're avoiding the conflict that's right next to us. That our flesh is craving to just lash out and say something about them and do something that's really going to hurt them. And it may feel good in the moment. But what's it going to do over time? So let me ask you this question. How are you going to train properly to be a peacemaker if you're allowing this conflict just to stay in your life because you don't want to handle the real issues? So here's the truth about being a peacemaker. According to the word of God, yes, God called you to be a peacemaker, but he also called you not to be a coward. To trust in him, that you can say things that are difficult and hard, but know that the love of God will be shown. Thank you, Ryan, so much, brother. Give him a round of applause. So here's what I want to do. For the remainder of the sermon, I'm going to list three points uh, from Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 18. And in both these chapters, Jesus is teaching us on how to deal with conflict with other believers when things get difficult. And I believe that 99% of the time, these methods right here will help solve your conflict and get rid. Because listen, here's what Jesus does. He tells you not only to handle it, but to get it out of your life. You hear me? He completely removes it so that you can train properly in the word of God. And so today, let's train properly in what God has for your life. The first point is this. Jesus said you need to settle your differences quickly. Not over time. Don't let it settle. Um, last week, we talked about that as well. If there's a misunderstanding, what do you need to do? You need to handle it very quickly because what happens in your mind? Oh, I wonder what they said now. I wonder what they did, right? Right? I wonder what they're, they're going to do. And you start to come up with all these ideas in your head to get them back. Here's what Jesus said. Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24. He said, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Now listen to this. And go and be reconciled to that person then come and offer your sacrifice to God. This is mind-blowing to me because Jesus is saying, it is better that you leave worship service and go reconcile with the person you have an issue with and then come back and worship the Lord. And then everybody got up and left, <laughs> right? But that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying it's better to get your heart right 
with the Lord, your heart right with somebody else that right now you feel like you may hate, that you have a hard issue with that you have not dealt with. It is better for you to go do that. Why? Because here's what Jesus was saying. This is what's so big about it. He's saying it honors the Father more. It honors the Father that you would go and reconcile this issue so that your heart may be right so it does not disrupt your intimacy with God or disrupt your prayer life, right? So that you can hear clearly on what God wants to do in your life. Because here's a powerful truth, all right? Peace is not the absence of conflict. Why? Because we live in a world full of conflict. It's everywhere, okay? Even with the people you love, right? So peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is to know Christ in the middle of conflict. And I love that. You trust Jesus no matter how bad it gets, no matter how hard it may seem, you trust Jesus through it, meaning because of Christ, because we have a firm foundation in him, it means that you can attack evil with good. Man, that's a different way to train. That's a totally different way to train. Listen to this, Romans chapter 12, verse 21. I love this. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, right? It cannot control you because no matter the situation, you're bringing in the goodness of God because you have Christ even in the middle of conflict. Because here's what Jesus is saying. Don't miss this. He's saying, how can you come into the presence of the Lord and ask for forgiveness? Yet in your heart, you hate or have bitterness or you have unforgiveness for somebody else. Because Jesus called out the Pharisees for being a hypocrite. God wants your heart right to be able to hear. And look, I know that it's hard. I know, but pastor, 99% of it is all their fault. And that may be true. But the point of it is, is to bring a solution to the problem. What is the solution? What God wants to do, the will of God, his grace, his mercy. That doesn't mean be a pushover. Tell them how you really feel. Tell them what hurt, but allow the love of God to move them and move you. Because guess what? When you do the will of God, then what they decide to do, that's up between them and God. You're freed from that. (laughs) You've given it over to the Lord. It's between them and God on what they decide to do now. For Matthew chapter 6, verse 15 tells us, but if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. And you could trust the Lord to deal with that person. My last two points come from Matthew chapter 18. And the first thing that Jesus addresses, this is a big one. He says, talk to that person one on one first. Talk to that person one-on-one. In fact, Jesus says, talk to them privately. Matthew 18, verse 15, if another believer sins against you, go privately. Some of us need to underline that. Go privately and point out their offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, then guess what? You have won that person back. Jesus said, go privately because in today's culture, I'm not going to go to them at all. I'm just going to tell everybody else. I'm going to tell everybody else, everybody's going to know our situation except you, right? Or I'm going to blast you on Facebook. I'm going to blast you on social media. I'm going to make sure I put this status just so you know how happy I am. But they know. They know the status. They know what it represents. And we're talking about another believer. So again, is it, is it your will that you're seeking or the will of God? Because if you're led in this way and you do these things, a lot of it is selfish ambition that attacks us, self-centeredness. Here's what self-centeredness would do to you. James chapter four, verse one. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that you battle from the inside? Meaning your selfish desire to always be right. It's me. And again, you may be hurt by somebody that did crazy things to you, but don't become like them. Don't be like them. 
Give it to God and allow God to do something that you can't do on your own. And how do you fight it? Let me share this. In conflict, you go one-on-one personally to somebody. The first thing we wanna do, what do we wanna do? Here's what you did. Here's how you made me mad. And we point the finger just like Adam and Eve. So here's my advice for you today. And this is difficult, but the strength of the Lord will help you. When you go and talk one-on-one, start off with what you have done wrong. And it may just be a little bit. I don't know your situation, but start off. Listen, I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I've done A, B, and C. And I know I could have done better, but I'm here to talk this out with you. I'm not pretending to be perfect. I just want to see a solution. I want to see God's will done because we're both believers, right? We both know that he's good. So we have to believe together that there can be good even in this conflict between me and you. And that means both of us have to see our own faults. And you know what it does? It opens their eyes because they came for a fight. They came to debate with you why you're bad, why they're good, right? Everything about you, when you open up like that, it makes them be real with you too. Okay, I'll open up. I could change too. And whatever they decide to do, again, that's between them and God, but you allow God to work on your heart and there will be a peace that comes from that, knowing you please the Father and you better believe it, that he has you, that he's guiding you, that he's protecting you, that he's for you. He will not leave you or desert you. I'm telling you, that's where the peace comes from. That's why we have it, the source of all hope. Lord, thank you, Jesus, that you're here that I don't have to act the way I used to act. I did the right thing. I followed you. That's the only right thing I can do is follow you. And my last point is this, that Jesus said, he said, if it comes down to this, then get help when needed. When it comes to another believer in the conflict that you may have, verse 16 and 17, Jesus said, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. But if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, this is what Jesus said. But let me make sense of this, because again, we're talking about another believer, right? Jesus is not saying just because they're being stubborn, treat them with disrespect. Jesus is not saying, treat them the way they're treating you if they're being harsh and rude and crude and all these things. No, Jesus is saying, he's relating it to the Jewish culture. Listen, if you tried everything you can and you've honored the Lord and you brought them to the church and you've had people in the situation and they still refuse to repent, then at that time, Jesus says, it's okay to no longer allow them in your inner circle. That's why he's relating it to the Jewish culture here. Treat them like the pagans and the tax collectors. Don't allow them so close to you to know everything about you. Pray for them, love them. Set this boundary now to do what? To protect your heart. And pray for the best for them. But you please the Lord. I'm gonna have everybody stand right here. I'm gonna ask our pastoral care team to come up front. Because when we talk about conflict too, a lot of us are scared due to two reasons. The first reason is what if I'm not smart enough? What if they have all these clever things to say and I just end up looking foolish? Listen, God says, just ask me and I will give you wisdom and direction and clarity. James chapter one, verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should just ask God who gives generously to you without finding fault and it will be given to you. The wisdom of the Lord can be given to you. Clarity and direction can be given to you, but are you asking? Or are you basing everything off of emotions first? And let me ask you this, and if you wanna come up front, come up front, it's time. But let me ask you this, if you feel fear and you're afraid, I want you to know that the Father is there and he will hold your hand and the Spirit of the Lord is inside of you. And it's your job just to stand up and believe and allow his words to pour through you. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven, for God gave us not a spirit of fear, but a power of love 
and of self-control. This is how you train to become a peacemaker for the kingdom of God. This is how you become different from the rest of the world. Hey guys, it's Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. Also, I want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So we love our Authentic family. Family, and thank you today for joining us.